welcome to episode 22 of our podcast. I'm Alex, one half of the Sober Experiment. And I'm Lisa, the other half. So how are you doing? I'm all right, Alex, are you? Yeah, I'm not bad, thank you. I managed to get out for a nice run this morning and I thought, um, we're like in our third week of lockdown, I think now, and I needed to get some um, cowpole for my youngest, who... I don't know whether he's sprained or broken his blooming finger on the trampoline. And there's no way I'm oh. sprained me. So I strapped up his finger, went to the cupboard, and there was literally half a teaspoon of the cowpaw. So I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to get any cowpaw anywhere. So I thought, right, I'll go for a run. So I did a 5K run, and then on the way past, ran past, um, say, not Sainsbury's, Superdrug, popped in and managed to get some. Ran home with my water in one hand and a bottle of Dettol and medicine in the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know what after speaking to you on the phone this morning I was like right and then this um our be sober whatsApp group kind of got me a little bit more motiv- motivated this morning I thought you know what I'm gonna go for a run I'm gonna get my stuff out and I'm gonna run so I got all my stuff on this morning and I put the couch to 5k on my phone yes so when I stopped doing that I was at week six so I thought oh, I'll just go back to like week four I don't need to go back to the beginning <laughs> well oh my god right I get to the end of the street it starts telling me to run you know after my walk and what have you and I took the dog with me as well because he was oh. quite good this time last year um at running anyway it kept stopping and sniffing while I was supposed to be doing my run I couldn't even do three minutes and I mean I looked I'm gonna I'm gonna say it I look quite good this morning I've got all my nice running gear on I put the little hat on and I thought oh I look like a proper runner and I ended up walking the whole way and then somebody walked past me like they'd seen me on the opposite side and then we ended up crossing paths and I was like oh the dog won't run and I blamed it on the dog <laughs> <laughs> well, I blame blamed Jeffrey and I got over and I thought oh that was really cruel why did I blame Jeffrey <laughs> well it was kind of half true because he wouldn't run maybe he's <laughs> as well I, can I make a suggestion yeah go back to week one oh, I'm, I'm not even doing it you know what I've decided right and this is what I thought on my walk back from my run <laughs> is you know like we always say how different we are yeah and I'm always like right meditate and you're like run or blah blah blah. so I thought you know what Alex runs I walk (laughs) that was was my thought today well good because it's right and if you feel like giving it another go go back to week one (laughs) but um yeah week one I have made a commitment to try those meditations that you've sent me starting today so I am actually going to try to meditate. So on our next podcast, if I remember that is, because they are coming too far between, I will, I will try to update people as to how that's going. Oh, I'm so pleased. A part of me wanted to then say, oh, right, well, if you're doing that, then I'll go back to eat one. But, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of being so I'm proud of you. I'm proud that your your intention was there. (laughs) Um, Speaking of Be Sober Manchester, our Mm -hmm. guest today is Julia Carson, who is the author of Sober Positive. And she's a personal friend, first of Lisa's, then of mine. And I know I'm going to say this again in a second when Julia actually comes on. But um, I'm really pleased to have Julia on talking to us today. Want to say anything else about the lovely Julia? Do you know what yeah, but I, I like doing podcasts like this because, you know, when you get to know somebody and um, like we've known Julie from going out with Be Sober Manchester, so you kind of get to know that person and you don't really ask or delve into anything before. So you kind of, when we do the podcast, we really get to know people, don't we? So I'm quite looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to actually delve into her past, so I hope she don't mind. I'm sure she won't, but um, I'm sure she's bold enough anyway to say, shut up, Alex, if she's uh, got a problem with this. Oh, she's gorgeous. <laughs> she is. So, yeah, here she is. Hi, Julia. Thanks so much for coming on. Hi, uh, it's great to be here, guys. Thanks for having me on. Well, oh. I was- Oh, you're going to speak, Lisa? Sorry, go on. <laughs> it's all right. I've got to get in as quick as I can with Alex. <laughs> 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 this is why we have the video really so I can wave and say let me talk <laughs> it is why we have the video yeah um, no I mean for anyone who knows 
our podcast, we, we talk about you fairly regularly, Julia, because you are, first of all, you were Lisa's friend through Be Sober Manchester. And then I obviously had the pleasure of meeting you shortly after that. So we do have like a, a friendship connection between the three of us, albeit yeah. not seeing each other for a little while. So I think people who listen to our podcast probably know, but if they don't, Julia is the author of Sober Positive and our good friend. So if you haven't read the book, please do, because I've read it and it is a really fantastic quick lit guide. Um, it also gives a slight insight into Julia's personality and things that she regrets and things she's happy with and so on. But what I'd like to find out a bit about being nosy Julia is the Julia who used to get trolleyed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, thanks guys so much for um, all the support you've given to to my book. And, uh, you know, it's been much appreciated because I am a listener of your podcast. And every time I hear my little name checks, I'm like, oh, that was me. Sure. So, <laughs> it means a lot. It really does. And, um, yeah, so, God, the me before. <laughs> um, I guess, well, I mean, how far do you want me to go back? Do, do, shall I just talk about kind of where, where I started from? And Yeah, why not? Let's have a bit of a, a bit of a autobiography from bit of a bit of a backstory okay. yeah, it's because like Alex said um we kind of know the you now and I can't even imagine Julia before so it will be kind of interesting to get a bit of a an insight to what really got you to the point of stopping drinking yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I started drinking kind of like everyone does, really. I grew up in Cumbria, in a small town that's uh, just outside Carlisle, and it was like one of these kind of small English towns where there was like literally nothing to do for teenagers apart from go out and get pissed. And I like, started off kind of in the park with a bottle of 2020 and that sort of thing. And then, um, obviously, we started going into pubs. And, like, again, coming from, like, a kind of small rural area, the pubs weren't bothered about ages and checking ID and all that kind of thing. It was, um, there was, uh, sorry, I've just been totally distracted by your cat, Lisa. <laughs> sorry. It doesn't matter <laughs> make an appearance. Oh. So sorry, everybody, for that. <laughs> Lisa's cat, Mr. Parker, has just appeared on camera. <laughs> <laughs> love it a photo bomb by a cat um, anyway as I was saying um, yeah so um, so yeah and then obviously started going out to clubs and all of that getting drunk with my friends and I think right from the off really I was always the one who would take it a bit far I was always the one who kind of didn't have an off switch and once I started drinking wanted to keep going and was quite often the one that um I remember like one of my very early experiences I think I talk about in the book was when I fell down some stairs in a nightclub when I was um, out for my friend's 18th birthday and my friends had to ring my dad and get to come and get me. So it was, it was kind of like that right from the start really that I was always the one that my friends were kind of helping home or whatever. I'd always like take it a bit far. And then um, it just kind of carried on from there. And for a long time, I really only drank socially, but when I did, I really went for it. And that was kind of, to be fair, it was like most weekends. But I was never, like, certainly in my 20s and early 30s, I never used to drink at home on my own. I would never mm. be in the habit of, like, getting a bottle of wine and having it at home. I think because I kind of knew that about myself and knew that once, once I started drinking, kind of all bets were off a bit. So I didn't really want to do it when I was just on my own because then I started worrying about it and thinking, you know, what does that mean about me? And, you know, if I ended up, like, staying at home and getting pissed on my own, what, you know, I, I would start having all those kind of, am I an alcoholic and all those questions coming in. So I just kind of avoided it, really, but that just meant I went out a lot and was kind of, you know, party girl. So, so yeah, so that was kind of, my 20s kind of looked like that, really, going out with my mates, drinking, overdoing it. And as my 20s went on, the hangover started getting a lot worse and yeah. I started really getting the after effects of drinking in a big way. And um, I was um, I was single for a lot of my 20s. I had kind of like short-term relationships, but I wasn't in a long-term relationship for really pretty much all my 20s. I had a boyfriend at university for three years. We split up pretty much as soon as we graduated when I was 21. Mm. And then I was pretty much single apart from some kind of flings and, and short-term things until I was 28 when I met my husband. So it was, that was all kind of nights out and stuff. And, you know, um, and then when I met my husband, that kind of shone a bit of a light on how much I used to drink because he's not a big drinker. So, um, and we're, we're separated now, by the way, but we're, when we're, we were together for 13 years. So like the latter part of my 
drinking life. I was I was in a serious relationship with somebody who was a very, very moderate drinker. And by moderate, I mean, even on a night out with friends, he'll have like two pints and everybody be like, come on, you're lightweight, whatever. And at home, mm-hmm. he just, just drinking just was not a thing. He just would never drink at home. And it used to drive me mad, to be honest, because I kind of wanted someone to share a bottle of wine with at home and all of that. But And I think that was when I got into the habit of having wine at home on my own because I was going out less because obviously I was getting a bit older and certainly when I had my kids obviously the, the opportunities to go out weren't there so much anymore so that and and you know because my husband didn't drink I just kind of fell into a habit then of drinking wine at home and that was that was what my drinking looked like after I had my kids but it was kind of on paper pretty moderate really but I still had the after effects and I still had on the occasions when I did go out I would still have the massive blowouts and like be and I would literally be in bed like I've heard you talk Alex about your dreadful hangovers yeah. I was exactly the same I was just incapacitated I would be in bed I would I would always be sick I would be like I'd like my mental health would just be in pieces I'd like usually cry at some point during the day and I would just literally I would be bed bound all day and I remember sometimes just literally thinking I feel like I need to be in hospital, like whether for physical, oh. the physical side of it or the psychiatric side of it, I don't know. But I would literally just like, I think I need to be in hospital, I can't go. And it would kind of last, and I would have awful anxiety that would like last for like, the whole of the following week. This is kind of early 30s, like, you know, just before I had my kids and then on the rare occasion, if I went out after I had them. And, um, and that just kind of got worse and worse. And then, yeah, so that's kind of, that's at the point of time when I stopped, my drinking looked like red wine at home or every week, not every night necessarily, but um, most nights, a couple of glasses at least. And then nights out with friend, still really going for it. That kind of, even though I'm a mum, I deserve it. It's my night off, whatever. It's my, you know, my, my me time, all of that. And just getting absolutely annihilated and then feeling wretched the next day and so guilty and just just horrendous you sound like um, a real cross between me and lisa you know yeah. <laughs> i didn't get the the, the the anxiety so much which you and lisa both got but the vomiting the hangover the drinking the red wine at home that's very me and you lisa you were a red wine drinker at home and yeah i practiced for years to be a red wine drinker yeah i did <laughs> it was so i mean you in your book you talk about the accident you had falling down the stairs and you were quite young then you, was you yeah i was eight, um, yeah i was eight, 18 uh, yeah i was just at university i was it was the october i went to university in september and then like six weeks later in the october I fell down the stairs and, and it was quite a serious accident wasn't it yeah, I was in uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary for a week, had a fractured skull, and then I was, they wanted me to stay in for two weeks, but I was like total stroppy teenager, just didn't, didn't really take on board the seriousness of the accident at all, I don't think, and was just, all I wanted to do was get back to my house of residence and carry on partying, really, because I'd met the guy who became my first boyfriend, and all I wanted, and, and I'd, had, I'd had this great plan that I was going to we were having this party and I'd, uh, I'd had this great plan of approach that I was, I was going to get off with him. And, and I was just absolutely devastated that all of this had been sort of kiboshed by the fact that I'd fallen downstairs. And I remember that was all I cared about. I just wanted to get back to halls and back to partying. And but they, um, yeah, they made me go home for a week. So I had a week in hospital and then a week back at my mum and dad's. Yeah. And then um, you were quite but, some time before you started to have a drink again. Yeah, well, they told me that I had to stop drinking for 12 weeks, which I pretty much stuck to because I think obviously it scared me a bit. So, yeah, I did. And I look back now and I'm, I'm not really sure why that was necessary, whether they just wanted to see if I could do it or whether they, um, I don't know. Yeah. So, but yeah, so I, I did pretty much stick to that. I remember like towards the end, because during that period, that, that sober period, I actually did get together with the, the guy that I'd had my eye on and, and he was then became my boyfriend for three years. And towards the end of those 12 weeks, once I'd started going out with him, we, I would, would kind of, if we were out on a night out, I'd be like, oh, give me a bit of your beer sort of thing. And I'd have like a little sip and stuff. And a little yeah. Sleep. But I didn't really have a lot to drink. But I remember like, what's, what's interesting to me now looking back is that I, didn't it didn't even cross my mind that drinking might not be a good idea for me it just didn't even register that you know that my kind of lack of an off switch had led to such serious consequences that I'd nearly died basically and like you know and completely yeah. traumatized my poor parents and and just you know had this horrendous head injury and it just didn't even cross my mind that it might not be a good idea for me to drink and I planned the um my kind of return to drinking with sort of, I remember like the 
for weeks before the date when I was allowed to start drinking again. I kind of planned it and had this whole, like I did this pub crawl all the way from, from Fallowfield in South Manchester where I lived all the way into the city centre and, you know, had it completely planned everywhere I was going to go. And it's just, I just look back and I think, God, it's, you know, when I, now I'm a mum myself of daughters, I think, God, you know, if that had happened to one of the girls, yeah. you know, but I think when you're 18, it's just, your priorities are so different, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are, and it's, come on, Lisa. <laughs> they are different. And it's like you said, that the switch doesn't click at that point. You don't associate everything that's kind of going wrong or, you know, even like for something like that, for you to fall down the stairs and go to hospital. I know looking back, and I'm quite ashamed to say it, but if that had been one of my friends at that time, I'd have been like waiting for it to get better so we could go out again. I wouldn't have even associated the two. Like, when did you kind of look back and think, oh my gosh, that is because I was drinking? Not really until... I think I was always in so much denial about it because I think I always knew that I wasn't like a, a normal drinker, whatever that is. And because there's this, that was, this is one of my main reasons why I wrote the book because at the time when I stopped drinking and it's less and less now, thanks to all the work that's going on, like you guys and, and the other podcasts and, you know, there's so much more going on now. But when I stopped drinking three years ago, there wasn't that much out there still that may sort of, that showed that there was anything other than a normal drinker and an alcoholic. And I just had this feeling, I just had this absolute horror of being an alcoholic. I just so didn't want to identify that way. I I saw it as like the end of the end of my life, you know, the end of any kind of fun in my life really. And uh, um, that I just couldn't imagine what my life would look like if I had to kind of declare myself an alcoholic and go to AA meetings and all of that. And I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong with that, if that's what works for people. But for me, it just was so not, it just, just didn't resonate. It didn't, you know, I I just couldn't imagine myself ever doing that. And um, so then I'm sorry, I've totally lost my thread. What was the the original question you asked? Just when did you first realise that falling down the stairs was as a result? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it, it wasn't really until I stopped drinking that I then looked back because I was always in, that's right, because I was always in so much denial about it because it's so, you know, I did, you know, I knew my drinking wasn't normal, but I didn't dare to look at it too closely. I didn't dare yeah. to, I kind of, even in my own mind, I sort of shied away from it. And, you know, if I started thinking, okay, well, this and that and the other has happened to me because I drink too much, then it would start making me think, okay, so that means you've got a problem. So that means you're an alcoholic. So that means your life's over. And that's the way that my, brain would go and then once I stopped drinking and realized how much better my life was I could then look back with less kind of emotional baggage about it and think okay so yeah that was because I was drinking and that was because I was drinking because the accident wasn't you know it wasn't the only thing it wasn't the only negative thing that happened to me in my life because I was drinking and um you know it's it's kind of looking back it's just something that I'm well shot of basically. And that's how I see it now. You know, it's not, I don't feel, I don't, I don't miss drinking. I don't, I don't feel sorry for myself that I can't drink. I just feel really relieved that I've finally kind of identified what, how much crap it brought to my life and that I've been able to, to, to to kind of, to realize that and to, to get out while I'm still relatively young, I guess. Can I ask you, Julia, because, you know, I think so many people will relate to that because the way you talk about your drinking is what we would have all classed as normal. Mm-hmm. You know, we like Alex said, you like such a mixture of the both of us and all the people I knew drank like that. So it's just, yeah. you know, um, how do you deal now with the things that, I know you mentioned then, you know, that wasn't the only negative thing um, to happen to you. How do you deal with them negative things now do you know some of them it wasn't really until I stopped drinking that I realized I still needed to deal with them um there was I mean there was certainly something which I kind of refer to kind of fairly obliquely in the book but I was I was um sexually assaulted when um I was 26 and although it's such a it's such a difficult and kind of delicate area to to say that happened because I was drinking and I certainly am not saying that women shouldn't drink because it puts them at risk of, of that but what what I the way I've kind of the way I see it for myself is that 
I, that it wouldn't have happened that night in that way to me if I hadn't been drinking that night. And that's something I've had to kind of come to terms with. And I did have counselling about it at the time to an extent, but it, it literally wasn't until I stopped drinking. And that was like many, many, like getting on for 20 years later, that I yeah. actually thought, Do you know what, I've not actually properly dealt with that. And there's still stuff in there that I still need to work through. And so that was, and I've, I've had sort of, you know, some quite intensive therapy about, about it since. And that's again, been kind of pretty transformative and, and has helped me so much. And again, it wouldn't, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't stopped drinking because I was so good at denying everything and kind of pushing everything down. And, um, I remember when I first started going to, to therapy about it, I remember saying to, to my therapist, it's, it's like everything's in a box and I don't want to take the lid off the box. And I think that's what drinking did for me for a lot. It kind of, I was kind of able to put everything in a box and just kind of leave it there and not deal with things. So I think that's the way just that kind I, of blot I, it out. Yeah. So the way that I did that, and and I guess sort of stopping drinking meant that I had to kind of properly deal with things. Mm. So kind of all the negative stuff that that happened, even though I'd kind of had some support with it at the time or whatever, then it wasn't really until I actually stopped that I was actually able to really properly do the work that was necessary to kind of properly deal with it and to be able to kind of move forward and, and properly, properly put it behind me. So it's another gift of stopping drinking, really, that I was able yeah, to do I, that. Yeah, I find the same with, you know, obviously I make it no secret. I know it's not the same thing that I had the miscarriage and I didn't, I put that away and just pretended it didn't happen in many ways. I mean, I, I thought I'd grieve, but it was only afterwards, once I'd managed to get, speak to Lisa about it properly and after stopping drinking, and I had counselling the same. And yeah. I know for a fact, I've had counselling previously when my dad passed away. And at the time, I remember thinking, oh, I'm okay. But when I stopped drinking, I started to grieve for my dad again. Mm. You know what? Therapy, I'm not saying it's, this is for everyone in the same way you're not. But therapy, counselling, it didn't work while I was still drinking because I wasn't really allowing things to come out and up to the surface. I was using mm. drink to keep it flattened if you like and keep it in the blocks I think that's a really good analogy and, and also you know thank you for sharing that because it's you know, it would be really difficult to share that on a podcast but there'll be so many people who can relate to your experience and hopefully come forward or learn to deal with it so we're really grateful both of us that you've been able to share that on our podcast thank you well do you know it just goes to show how much I have dealt with it because like three, four years ago before I stopped drinking and, and uh, you know, had some more therapy, I, I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have talked about it. You know, I just literally couldn't have said the words. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing really where stopping drinking's brought me in, well, in loads of ways, but, but that's certainly one of them, yeah. Oh, oh, Julia, it really is, you know, because I can really get that, that you didn't, that you couldn't, have spoke about it before it is amazing what stopping drinking does and and it's also really frightening for people because when they kind of know that things have happened that they don't want to deal with it's easy to try and keep that lid on that box isn't it and yeah. just think you know what I'm not I'm not going to open that just yet and it can be frightening thinking that when you do stop drinking that you're going to have to deal with it but I think it's more about wanting to deal with it yeah. As and I well. think as well, like in part, not wanting to deal with it, it was again me not wanting to deal with my drinking because it happened when I was drinking. It happened because somebody, I think, put something in my drink. And, you know, so it's very much tied up with my drinking in, in, in ways that it, you know, that it might not be for some people. And um, I think in order to properly face it, I had to first face up to the fact that I was a problematic drinker because I was in so much denial about that. I just couldn't deal with anything remotely associated to it either I think that might have been part of it which is kind of I've never really thought about it like that until this moment but it's yeah it's I think that stopping drinking made me a lot freer in my own mind if that makes sense it because when I had all these kind of things that I couldn't think about before and now I'm just a lot freer to kind of you know because I'm really honest with myself and I'm, I can really properly look at myself and I'm not making excuses. So I think yeah. it's, yeah, that's a big shift that stopping drinking's definitely done. I wish we could bottle up sober <laughs> and give it to people because it, before when you were saying about 
um, the term alcoholic and it and we grew up in the same kind of you know you was either a normal drinker or you was an alcoholic there was no in between and the thought of being an alcoholic to some people especially to me and like what you said Mm. it's so flipping scary you're like I can't be one of them I can't you know you have this picture in your mind of what it is and I think that's something that we work hard on doing is kind of taking the stigma away from the word sober you know there's a, a million other reasons and it's also what I love that you called your book sober positive yeah mm. yeah I do you know you know in your book as well and this is something that I just wanted to talk about and, and I hope you're comfortable enough to talk about this because there's there were, there were more than one moment but there's one moment in particular that made me cry um and it, it's the comparison of the two times when you were breastfeeding your children oh yeah and it it really fell it filled me with such emotion how sad you were at that point on after the birth of your second child Mm. that you 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 describe it if you can yeah so I suppose that I mean that was my kind of that was my trigger for stopping that was what brought me to the conclusion that I had well I think well I say stopping but at first it was the conclusion I came to was that I had to find a way to control it and it wasn't until I read Annie Grace's The Snaked Mind that I thought actually the way I control this is by stopping it completely yeah. but so what happened was um, when I um, had my first daughter, who is now six, um, I that was that was kind of that resulted in a big shift to my drinking because the year before I'd had her, the year before I conceived her, I had it was like the first year of our marriage, and um, we started trying pretty much as soon as we were married because we I was thirty five when we got married. Yeah, we, we met when I was twenty eight. I was thirty five when we got married. So as soon as we were married, I was like, right babies and um so then we had a year when we were trying kind of unsuccessfully for a baby and I had um sort of several early miscarriages and one that was at 10 weeks and that was quite traumatic and again that's you know it took me a long time to get over it was just and it was just a horrendous year my uh, my mother-in-law also became terminally ill and passed away that year it was just the shittest of shit years you can possibly imagine it was just horrendous and um my drinking during that year was kind of I was on this monthly cycle of each month we would try and and get pregnant and then I would I wouldn't drink for the period of time where I thought I might be pregnant and then I would get my period realize I wasn't pregnant and then go on a massive drinking binge and then feel like death for the following week after that and that was just I did that for a year on a kind of rolling cycle so then obviously I went from that directly into pregnancy and then so then had suddenly a year's break from drinking which was the longest I'd ever gone without drinking since I was like I don't know, 16, 17. So, so then at 36, I suddenly had this year long break from drinking and my life suddenly became a lot less chaotic. Cause you can imagine that year of that kind of cycle of binge cry repeat was, was just yeah. kind of it just such a horrendous, chaotic, messy year. And, um, I then had like this year of kind of calm and peace and, and, and that, that kind of carried on. And then, so then once, um, I started drinking, I did it much more gradually and I kind of didn't go straight back into the kind of bingy lifestyle because one, because it wasn't really possible because obviously I had a small baby. And yeah. I also lived um, out in um, Tameside in um, kind of a bit, you know, quite far out of central Manchester. So I couldn't get a taxi home. I had to go, you know, if I did go out, we'd have to get the last train back. And, you know, it was um, just the opportunity to drink just wasn't there anymore. And I, so then that's when I did start the red wine at home, but I did, tend to keep that to a couple of glasses a night for the most part because my little girl didn't sleep very well and and I kind of thought during that period in between my two daughters that I was like I've I've cracked this I've done it I've gone from having a really messy relationship with alcohol to actually being a moderate drinker being a kind of sensible wine mummy couple of glasses at home laughing at the wine memes on Facebook it's all (laughs) marvellous and you know and I was I was but so then, and there was what I wrote about in the book, there was one night when I had my um, my little girl, my elder daughter in my arms and she was actually bottle feeding by that stage. So um, because I, I did get her onto the bottle 
fairly quickly. <laughs> yeah, the, the law of getting back on the wine was was probably um, quite significant there. But yeah, so she she was bottle feeding and and she was on my lap and um, I just remember looking down at her and just thinking, "You have saved me. You have just saved me. You've made my life so much better." And then. After I had my second daughter, who's three now, um, I, again, first of all, started with kind of pretty moderate glass of wine here and there. But I did notice that I started started drinking earlier. I started drinking while I was still breastfeeding after my second daughter, which I didn't do with my first. And I started drinking more more often and, and more quantities. And I also moved house when my littlest one was three into an area where I was walking distance from bars and restaurants. I lived a lot closer to my friends who had always been my drinking buddies over the years beforehand and who are still my best friends now you know they've been amazing about my sobriety but but yeah I was kind of I just had all these opportunities to drink again which I hadn't had when my little one when my eldest sorry was was little and it just felt like the wheel started to come off and I also actually started on antidepressants which seemed to have the effect on me that it it stopped me kind of being up tight about the girls because I was overly uptight about certainly my eldest in terms of like you know being kind of obsessive about hygiene and really anxious and all of that kind of thing and then when I had postnatal depression diagnosed after my little one then and started taking antidepressants it was like I was just just didn't care anymore and which was a really good thing in a lot of ways but with the drinking it was like oh it's it's Wednesday so what I deserve it or you know and I suddenly start, it was like somebody had just taken the lid off it and my drinking kind of went wash and both in terms of I started getting kind of hammered on nights out again and also started drinking more at home until um it got to the point where I think my little one was like nine months old and I started getting to the point where I could leave her for long enough to go out on like a proper night out and I had um so this was 2017 I had a night out in the January for my uh, my best friend's joint 40th married couple who had a joint 40th and then a night, another night out in February for my own 40th and both those nights blacked out completely had no clue how I got home didn't just just had no idea what I'd been doing for kind of hours because I'd had so much to drink and the second one of those my own 40th that was my last night drinking because the next day and again this is what Alex is referring to the oh, next yeah. day so I went I woke up, well, I woke, because I woke, first of all, I woke up downstairs on the sofa and I still had my um, my clothes on from the night before. I still had my contact lenses in. I kind of looked down and I could see a glass of wine, which meant that I'd carried on drinking on my own when I got in from the night out. And I was just like, oh God. And then kind of stumbled off to bed and had like another hour or so sleep. And then my little one woke up and she needed a feed and I had to feed her and I knew I shouldn't feed her. I knew that I had far too much alcohol in my system to be, to be feeding her. But I had two because she was hungry. I'd not expressed any milk for her. We'd not started on formula at that point. I, no, I think she, well, I had we started on formula, but any, for some reason I knew that I had to breastfeed her. And while I was feeding her, I was just literally weeping on top of her little head. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I just sat in bed feeding her and crying. And that was when I just thought, you know what, something's got to give here. Something's got to change. And that was when I um, ordered this Naked Mind and, and very quickly realised that the way for me to control alcohol was to not drink it. And then have, that was that did end up being my last night drinking, even though I hadn't, I didn't kind of plan it in terms of, I didn't think beforehand, this is my day one, I'm going to stop yeah. it, I'm going to have a last night drinking. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't actually know that I'd stop forever until afterwards. Like the first few days, it was just a horrendous hangover and, you know, the usual anxiety and feeling dreadful. And then it wasn't until a couple of weeks down the line where I was like, actually, do you know what, I might keep going with this. Yeah, and then, you're right, you're right, three years later, still, still keeping going with this. So they seem to just, be the most successful, though, don't they, Lisa? You know, but people who go, you know what, and have that turning point, like your last hangover, my last hangover, your moment of clarity while you're breastfeeding. When it, yeah, it really clicks, doesn't it? Yeah, I think yeah, you, you have to get to that point of yeah of knowing that you re- you really you're done. I was just done. I was just so bored of it because, I, you know, at that point, I'd been. I've been doing this, this kind of cycle of getting pissed and feeling bad about myself for 
like getting on for two decades and I was just really done. <laughs> you just get tired of it, don't you? You get tired of flipping, lying to yourself and finding reasons to talk yourself out of why you've done stupid shit and you're trying to yeah. like make it all right like oh everyone does that and it's all right and then all of a sudden you know when you get that like you said that reality switch of you know what this is just enough I'm sick of lying to myself I'm si- I'm just I can really feel it from you and you make you're making me go back to that point of I was so bloody sick of it yeah um what have you done then? Because, you know, how long is it now? Did you just? It was say? three years in February, so it's like three years and a couple of months. Which is just amazing. You've done an amazing job. You've wrote your book. You've inspired loads of other people. What keeps you, Julia, sober and positive? Oh, there's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, it's a bit harder <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I didn't even plan that one. It just came. <laughs> <laughs> very good and <laughs> um, oh do you know i'm not that, i have to say i'm not that positive a lot of the time at the moment <laughs> because, listen, you know, going through, like, because i don't know when people will listen to this podcast so we will just put out there actually that right at this very moment we're kind of all locked down aren't we yeah yeah this um, is like a full-on the lockdown covid19 pandemic so if you're listening to this in five years time we're doing pretty well to have a laugh <laughs> we really so, are so it's been what's it it's been three weeks for me because i was in self-isolation for the week before oh. everyone getting locked down so this is like so i've, I've done three weeks so you know it's all merged into one. <laughs> it's like literally i don't even know what day it is so you're, you're looking at i remember to dial into this to be honest because <laughs> i work from home anyway but it's yeah it's just been it's just been a bit full on but yeah so what keeps me so positive i think that Oh God, it's a really tricky one because under normal circumstances, I think yeah. it's, I, I, I do love it. I wrote a whole chapter about it in the book because I do love a night out. I really do. And I ne- that was the one thing that I just thought would be dead in the water. I really did. I just, I never anticipated being able to have fun sober because when I drank, if I had to go out and not drink for any reason, I absolutely hated it. Just would sulk all night and be jealous of everyone drinking and just yeah, yeah. just wouldn't have a good time at all and it's just that like even, a even us now isn't it though you know, like know. When, we were, when we were last out in Manchester and we saw all the zombies oh no I know that was such a good night <laughs> that was I mean that yeah that night was ace that was such a good night when we went to the um, the power ballads night at the yeah. Ritz it was so good and and I just I love it and I love going out with my friends who still drink as well and um, I actually feel more more relaxed dancing with people who I know when they're a bit tips <laughs> yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm the best dancer in the world but I think oh well if they're pissed they don't care so I just really go for it and you know <laughs> but yeah I just I, I really do still enjoy a night out although I can't stay out as late as I used to but I think that's no bad thing again the small small kids but but yeah and then I think what I love is all the other things that I've sort of added in because in the first six months to a year for me what really worked was to kind of build what what I've referred to in a book and I didn't come up with this it's called this by lots of people but a sober toolbox and I kind of built this this kind of structure for my sobriety in the the kind of things that were essential like yoga is a massive essential one for me like I'm, I'm still doing it now with online classes and stuff because it's literally like you know I'm, I'm, I'm stealing um, stealing a phrase from my friend Kate from the Love Sober podcast now but it, it's like literally if I do yoga I'm okay if I don't I'm not and it is that simple for me mm-hmm. so there's certainly that and a meditation as well is linked to that so they're, they're kind of the things that keep me sane and are definitely keeping me sane through this period the relationship that I've got with my kids is just you know I, I just wouldn't like to think how different it would be really if, if I'd carried on drinking and if I'd kind of got worse and worse with my drinking and what that would have done to our relationship as, as mother and daughters so you know be, being able to be there for them 24 7 will never fail to keep me kind of feeling good and positive it's so too. good that isn't it that thought of if anything was to happen in the night if one of them suddenly took ill I'm not going to be drunk I'm going to be able to do yes. what I need to do it is I I feel that my children are older than yours two of them and one's similar age mm. I, I get that and I know Lisa does just being yeah. a present parent is worth its weight in gold definitely I remember definitely. Um, going to a wedding when oh, my eldest then would have been about five or six and she broke a collarbone 
and it was a nightmare because obviously I drank then so we were at a wedding it was over in Burnley we needed to get back home the full process of trying to get home get to an infirmary get to and even then it never clicked (laughs) like it it made it worse because we'd had a drink but even going into the A&E and being a little bit tipsy in our wedding outfits you know it was just embarrassing like really embarrassing so like you said to know that if anything ever were to happen or and the relationship you can have with them like my relationship with my girls is just so much more than I ever hoped for because I've stopped drinking and I think you know as yours get older you'll continue to be able to have that and that's really special really special yeah definitely and then the other thing I was going to say is sober friends because you know you guys and the rest of the Manchester crew and and my friends from Soberistas and um, I'm in another Facebook group with with some lovely ladies that um, I met through Kate and Mandy and it's you know I'm, I'm just my social life and my kind of support network is so much richer and so much better and and you know the, when, when we get together we just have such a laugh and it's just you know it's I just just really love how much kind of friendship and fun that sobriety has brought to my life which is the again it's the opposite of what I thought would happen I thought I was going to be yeah. an outcast and you know there were like I think that was like when I certainly when I first joined Soberistas three years ago and um started writing blogs on the sites and, and getting comments and stuff which is how my writing started that I was just like, oh my God, there's all these people out there and they're just like me. Like they drink like me and they're worried about their drinking like me. And, I've, you know, I think because no one talks about it, you know, if people want to lose weight or if they want to quit smoking or whatever, they'll talk about it and they'll say, you know, I want to do this or whatever, but nobody did. And so well, maybe, I don't know if they still do, but certainly nobody did when I quit drinking. It was nobody no. talked about it. It just wasn't talked about. And, you know, it was like, if you had to stop drinking, you had to kind of go off to weigh it. AA quietly and not make a fuss about it and not spoil the party for everyone else and you know it was just yeah. like this secret thing that nobody talked about so I think again that I think that was another big driver for me in writing the book that it's I think there's a lot of people out there that are feeling very alone with it right. and it's it's something that affects so many of us so many of us now I think our generation as a whole, drink so differently to how our parents' generation drank on the whole. It's, you know, alcohol's changed in how we use it in our, in kind of in our lifetimes for those of us who were kind of, you know, of a certain age. And, you know, the, the amount of people that I have met since I stopped drinking and sort of, you know, I'm including in that people who are now sober and people who still drink but are kind of maybe start, you know, they've talked to me about worries they have or whatever because they know about my book that it's just staggering how many people are affected by alcohol in a kind of negative way nowadays and so I suppose yeah that was why I sort of wanted to put it out there that it's do you know what it's okay to be sober it's it's good to be sober it's not the end of everything you can actually have a really good fulfilling fun interesting good life on the other side of it I love that because there is so many people, like you said, when we all go out, we can have such a lovely time. And it is scary, isn't it, at first to think, I'm never going to be able to go out again. I am, I'm going to hate it. I'm not going to be able to do this and I'm going to be lonely and on my own. And I think you do have to work at it a little bit and put yourself... Oh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight, for sure. There's de- definitely... It's not it's natural, it. is it, to put yourself no. into a social situation at first without a mm. alcohol in your hand. Mm. And it's a readjustment process, I think, as well, it yeah. is. And it, it does take time. But but no, I think I was probably about... I remember the first night I went out and really enjoyed myself not drinking was um, a friend's party when I was about I think probably about seven eight months sober and that yeah. was a, before that I remember before that it was always a bit of an effort I was always a bit relieved to be going home and I was always you know kind of but I remember that night I just had a ball and I had you know I was on the dance floor half the night and it was like I just it just suddenly clicked that I was like oh, okay I can do this and not drink and it's still fun you know and I, I think the amount of different types of drinks that we can have now as well really helps that you know it's we don't just have to have lukewarm orange juice or diet coke or whatever you know there's such a lot of different things we can drink that that taste like grown-up drinks that taste almost like alcohol in in some cases and that kind of for me gives me a bit of a sort of placebo effect and like makes me feel a bit you know I will 
I'll probably feel more like having a dance if I've had an alcohol-free beer than if I've had a Diet Coke. And I don't know why that is. It's weird. <laughs> it is but. feeling part of the crowd. And I think I also really believe that it's the sugar rush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some of that going on. <laughs> it does make a difference. I still drink quickly if I'm out with a different type. You know, mm. if I was to have a non-alcoholic drink or a grown-up drink at home, I'd I don't really have that much. It'd take a lot for me to finish a, a bottle of non-alcoholic lager. Yeah, um, but, but when I go out with people, I still have that social anxiety a bit. So I drink it really, really quick. You know, yeah. like when we had our first ever Be Sober Manchester meetup and it was at the Dish Room in Manchester. Uh-huh. I went on. I could not sleep, right, all night. <laughs> One, because I'd been so nervous and excited about going to going there but I'd yeah. had like all these es- um, espresso martinis non-alcoholic obviously <laughs> so coffee at night right and <laughs> drinking nervously quick like I remember getting on the train thinking I feel weird <laughs> I feel wired <laughs> yeah I did and I was still up at like three in the morning going this is weird are you sure that was non-alcoholic but yeah looking back it was the coffee and the nerves and the so I know, I like but it makes you, it does, it makes you it. question yourself, definitely. I had, um, <laughs> my worst one of them was I went out on a night out for my mate's birthday. We went to Band on the Wall, so it was like a proper night out and like dancing and like, I was out till about three, I think, and I had three Red Bulls and oh my God. <laughs> like, oh, I'd, I'd have been, I'd have been I was, like, I was like on one, I was proper on one. I just could not get to sleep. It was about five in the morning before I finally got to sleep and then obviously I was up with the kids at seven. So I felt, at least oh, you're up without that hangover because well. <laughs> So, yeah, but you yeah, do get. It wasn't as bad. It was. It was. A, there, were, there was a bit of a kind of a sugar caffeine hangover. Yeah, I was going to say you get like the bad. tiredness, don't you? Still, and you get you do get the sugar hangover, but it's not vomiting and crawling around on our floor no, and, and crying and feeling an old girl. <laughs> no, definitely, and not, not answering your phone, phone for a week. <laughs> oh God, not even daring to look at your phone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> text you sent. <laughs> well, honestly Julia I think that this podcast is going to help so many people right now and you're just such a warm funny upbeat person it's so lovely to have you on oh bless you thank you you are and I mean that I've, I've been really looking forward to this it's not going to help me because I want to go out now you <laughs> <laughs> have to sit in your coffee bar. Um, uh, before well, this, we do go, well, this is all over. We'll have a night out, definitely. Yeah, one hundred percent. Before we do go, could you just tell people whereabouts on social media they can find you and how? And um, if you've got any kind of top tip or anything for anybody to get sober and stay sober. Okay, so yeah, on social media, I am at Sober Positive on Instagram, and I've also got a Facebook page that, to be fair, um, I'm, apologies to anybody who follows me on Facebook because I put very little on there. I'm really lazy when it comes to Facebook. But again, that's Sober Positive on Facebook. Uh, my book is on Amazon in um, Kindle and paperback copies. Thank you so much to everyone out there who has bought it and read it. it I'm hugely appreciative of every single um, reader. It's just it feels quite surreal still to be honest that it's done so well I'm just absolutely blown away by the amount of people who bought it the comments I've had on it it's just way beyond anything that I could ever have hoped for as a a self-published author so it's just brilliant and like is that and that is in a large part thanks to like people like you guys being so supportive of it having me on the podcast and you know it's just a just want to take the opportunity to say thank you so much for that because oh. it means a lot oh, and uh, what was the other one about top, top tips for how to um to get and stay sober i would say don't wait for the right time to do it the right time is now just go for it because i put it off for so long thinking oh well it's not right at this point because i'm doing this and that and the other and actually you know i mean i think that a lot of people might be very tempted to think at the moment it's not the right time but what have you really got to lose? It's, you know, and I would just say go for it and you will be pres- pleasantly surprised really quickly how much better things are. And like, I honestly, even though things are a bit shit <laughs> with the lockdown for everybody, I, every day I think, thank God I don't drink anymore. Genuinely, I do. I'm so grateful for it. It just makes my stress levels so much easier to manage. It's just, 
yeah, it's just a gift at the minute. It really is. And also to once you've made that decision to, to stop drinking, I would say just immerse yourself in the sober world because there is so much out there. There's podcasts, there's books. Um, not that that's a hint in any way. There's but it stuff should on, be stuff on, blooming brilliant. Thank you. There's stuff online. There's um, websites like Soberistas where you can link up with other sober people. And there's just, you know, particularly now when we're all kind of stuck communicating online for the most part, you know, you can get so much connection and support. That's one of the reasons I'm really grateful to be sober because I've kind of got this ready-made online network of friends and people that I already talk to online a lot. So, you know, I've kind of got all that in the way that my friends who's, who haven't gone through a period of, of having to stop drinking maybe don't have. So... So yeah, I would I would say go for it and give it everything you've got. Just throw yourself into it and immerse yourself in the, the world of sobriety because it is surprisingly good and there's so much support out there. And the more you learn, the more you want to learn. It's like, it sounds like cheesy to say it's a journey, but it is. It's, you know, as, as time goes on, I just feel like I'm still learning and, you know, it's, it's like it never stops. I think I was always getting in my own way with my drinking and now I've stopped doing that. It's like, I'm just on this kind of exponential path of like, I don't know, just learning more and, and doing more. And it's just the best thing that I've ever done for myself by miles. Wow, that's amazing. I don't yeah, think we realise, do we, how much drinking holds us back. And I think to see all the things that you've achieved and to listen to that is just, I, I said this like quite more and more, the more we speak to people, but if I wasn't already sober and I listened to something like this, I'd be like, give me some of that. <laughs> it's like you say, if we could bottle it up, if we could make a pill that made people feel like <laughs> sobriety feels, it, it would be a bestseller. We'd be billionaires. I, I <laughs> think that's so true. Yeah. You know, if, if people think that feeling drunk is good, you want to feel sober. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, thank you so, so much, much, Julia. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. It's been brilliant. Right. It's been lovely to see you both as well. Have a, uh, and you yeah, have a lovely you. rest of the day. You too. Yeah. Speak to you soon. In the garden, yeah. enjoy the sunshine. Speak to you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.